Hello, I'm Anita Bath. We continue to cope with the pandemic, keeping our bubbles small, working from home if we can. It's not easy, but we're here to cheer you on. This is our Vancouver. Coming up, never underestimate the power of a good hairstyle, even on Zoom. And when this hasn't been your week, your month, or even your year, a Vancouver woman recreates the friend's couch in her front yard. But first, sudden change is something we all relate to. A local author has tips on how to pick yourself up and reconnect with what matters to you. This pandemic has changed so many lives. Some have seen their chosen careers completely shelved. Others have experienced the end of a relationship. Michael Tranmer knows all about force change. He's a coastal engineer leadership coach and a TEDx speaker. His new memoir is called Satori Ananda, Awaken to Happiness. Thanks for being here, Michael. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure, Anita. I want to start with a little bit about you. What was that big moment in your life that made you realize something had to change? Well, I had the, like you mentioned, the, the fortune of having the change happen to me. And it was when my marriage ended and that was absolutely not the, the plan. We were together and we were, had the vision to, to go the distance in the long run. And then when it came to that real sudden end and this whole vision of this future that I had for us and for myself was gone. And for the first time in my life, I really felt this emotional pain that I had never felt before. And in addition to that, I just had this, this blank canvas where before I had this vision of where I was going. So it was a complete reset for, for me. Sounds tough, but also very relatable, I think, for a lot of people, to say the least. Was that rock bottom? And if not, what did rock bottom look like? Well, if, if that wasn't rock bottom, Anita, it had certainly followed within the weeks and months that followed afterwards as I got more clear on on why the relationship had ended and then also got these realizations and these truths about what role I had played within it. And this was both very painful, but also very powerful to get this clarity on on who I was in the past and how I wanted to improve to become the person that I knew I could be and I knew I was capable of. But the the rock bottom was was like that it was because i knew i knew i knew as an engineer that if i was to re-engineer my life it meant that i could not leave any of those stones unturned no matter what i found underneath in the pain wow i mean it could have gone completely the opposite way so what steps did you take to figure out what to do next yeah absolutely it, i took three steps in there it took the commitment and the clarity and the courage. The first one really was with the commitment to pick myself up off the ground. I knew the absolute worst thing for me was to be in the same painful position lying on the same living room floor a year later. So I made that commitment to myself to do whatever it was going to be to find that happiness again. So I started reading all the books, listening to all the podcasts and taking some advice from, from some friends. So it was that commitment to pick myself up. After that, it was getting the clarity on who I was going to become now. What was I going to put on my blank slate? And to get that clarity, I did all the things. I did the meditation. I spent time in nature. And I got really clear on what I wanted to do now, now that I really had this freedom, this new canvas that I could paint on. And within that, I, I discovered that I... For the first time in my life, I really enjoyed expressing myself. I enjoyed expressing myself through the writing and the public speaking. In my life before that, I was just a quiet, reserved engineer. So it was such a radical transformation. With that clarity on who I was, the, the final step was the courage to really step into this life of, of living this, this life of being a speaker and a writer. Well, and I want to talk a little bit more about that transformation. So you talk about how your life was before, how it is now, but tell me a little bit more. What is so different now from before? I think it's just this real, this real passion and this purpose to, to serve others through, through my speaking and my writing. And I have really big and lofty goals on how to do this. And sometimes I get a little frustrated that I'm not there yet. But what, what drives me is that I know that, I know, I know, Anita, that I've, I went from such a dark place where I was, for the first time in my life, really, really alone and, and lost. 
But I also knew that all the books and all the things that I learned in my transformation, I got to not only a place of content that I was at before, but living and breathing in this new passion and this new purpose. I've had these moments of these real Satori and uh, moments with these uh, really beautiful times. That's re really peaceful life that I get to live. So I know what I have learned and I know that there are so many people that can also benefit from this same way of life. You recently wrote a column about connection and how in this pandemic we need to put down our phones. Interesting to me as someone who has acknowledged recently that this pandemic has had me on my phone so much more than I used to be. And I'm thinking about, you know, how can I get off my phone? Why was it important for you to write that? Yeah, it was just something that I really felt that I needed to express because everything that, that I've learned in this whole transformation is that this real human connection is is all that matters and it's it's these memories and these moments and this feeling of being with each other is is one of the things that really helps bring us fulfillment in this life and as useful as the phone is for these tools i mean we're using it to connect right now when we pass each other in the street or when we are in line with someone at the the coffee shop and we can meet them with our gaze and our eyes and, and have that connection, acknowledge them as another beautiful human and see their soul and see their pain and see their story through their eyes. It's these moments that I catch throughout the day, which really, really light me up, which I didn't even know I was missing in my previous life. Absolutely. You're sort of never in the moment when your eyes are always down at your phone. So what advice do you have for people looking for that real connection? And it takes it takes courage. It takes courage to to look up and and catch the gaze of someone passing you on the seawall. That's what I wrote about in that column. Is when I'm out for runs, some people look me in the eye and some people won't. And sometimes I'm into it, and sometimes in a bad headspace or whatever it may be. But it really just takes that courage to be seen and to be seen for your flaws, to be seen for your insecurities, but just to put yourself out there. And it just this really magical thing happens when you take that courageous step to connect and gaze with someone else and just be present with them for only a few moments. Courageous sounds about right. It's not an easy thing to do at all. Um, how do you hope that we can all learn and grow from this COVID-19 pandemic that has got a lot of people pretty down? Yeah, and it's it's definitely, it's definitely been hard and I've definitely experienced up and downs myself and everyone else I associate with. But I, I just think, again, it's such an opportunity to, to use this as a mirror. And I was fortunate to hit my rock bottom. Some people don't get that same fortune, but perhaps this pandemic and whatever shift has happened in their life can be that catalyst to really take stock of where you are in your life with your relationships, your job, your health, whatever it may be. And if something, if you feel that it could be better, it probably can. So then apply your commitment to make the change, get clarity on what you want to be and take that courage to change whatever it is in your world to wake up to your best life. Great advice, Michael Tranmer, thank you so much. My pleasure. Hi, my name is Gina. This is our Vancouver, so beautiful. Here's another story about connection and happiness. A Vancouver woman has found a creative way to keep in touch with her neighbors. She's recreated the set of the hit show Friends on her front lawn. As our Gian Paolo Mendoza found out, it's a way for people to feel less isolated during these tough times. <laughs> So if somebody comes for a chat, if they sit there, I'll sit at the end of the couch here. As long as we're far enough apart, it's really breezy here, so I'm not at all worried about catching or spreading anything. Mind you, I'm not partying down at Kitts Beach either. <laughs> so. Lots of people discover it by accident because people are getting out more and they're trying to find places in their neighborhood and this is a wonderful place to walk. Whenever COVID ends and we're, we're sort of able to sit a little closer, then we can 
do the jigsaw puzzle or play the trivia game, have coffee. Time now for one of our favorite features when we showcase a number of the photographs sent in by you, our audience. Richard Topping was in the right place at the right time along the Richmond Dyke to see this eagle coming out of its nest. Really great image, Richard, thank you. And Christine Nanji brings us this unique view of the beach with Burrard Inlet in the background. Wonderful composition there, Christine. Finally, Jan Pazhau brings us an image of the times, three women in conversation along Vancouver's seawall. A safe, socially distanced conversation. Thank you, Jan. And please, send us more. You can email them to bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's bcphotos, all one word, at cbc.ca. Well, the news has been full of stories about all kinds of essential workers throughout the pandemic. Some of those frontline employees are teenagers. CBC Kids news contributor Anisha Latchman checks in with a group of young people to see how things are going. Whoa, um, hi, do I know you? I'm you from one year in the future. Wow, time travel, huh? That is not even the craziest thing I've heard this year. Just tell me. Are we still in quarantine in 2021? Well, I mean, quarantine, lockdown, stay at home, different words, same thing. But it is so nice to talk to someone else. There's only so many conversations you can have with yourself in the mirror, you know? Right, because this is so much better. Totally. Last year, I spoke to some teen essential workers about what life was like working during a pandemic. One year later, I'm back to check in with them and see what's changed, what's improved, and what's not so improved. Let's go. I definitely thought it was going to last like two weeks, and here we are a year later. <laughs> Over the past year, would you say you've gotten better at balancing work life with your personal life? My social life is pretty much only at work. I've made very good friends with the people I work with now because I'm there all the time. I think that if I didn't go to work, I think I would actually be losing my mind being stuck in my house all day. When the pandemic first started and I offered to move into the residence, I thought I was going to stay there for a couple of weeks, but I actually ended up staying there six months. Have you noticed a change in how the residents act at work? So do they respect the rules more or maybe not as much? They respect the rules for obvious reasons, uh, to keep themselves and uh, the others safe, but I do hear a lot of them talk about how they miss their family and how they really wish that they could go outside, but they are, they are very understanding of the situation. I, through this time, I realized that there's two kinds of people. There's the people who really care, they're really nice, you can tell that they appreciate that, like you're there and everything. And then there are the people who literally could not care less, don't want to listen, are rude. And honestly, it gives you entertainment for the day. I kind of like to go to work because on my like days off, I'm kind of bored and I'm sick of being home. Now with the cases being so high, I am definitely like a little bit more like scared and cautious. Like I definitely could feel myself in the summer kind of relaxing a little bit more with everything. But I'm like, no, no, like this is serious. Two masks, like gloves, everything. Our residence was recently on the papers because we have never gotten a COVID case at the residence. So yes, we are still in lockdown, but with a very, for very good reasons. Last time we spoke, you mentioned about how you share your traditional dancing with the residents. The traditional dancing I do is called hoop dancing. Now hoop dancing is a medicinal dance. How has your traditional dancing grown over the past year? My style has grown a lot. Um, I'm doing a lot more of an intricate style and um, intricate moves. I'm always looking forward to it. The residents are always looking forward to it. Um, they keep asking me, oh, when are you going to come dance next? So I, I know that they like it and that, that warms my heart so much. That was the whole point of it. How have you adjusted to balancing online school with work over the past year? Um, honestly, I had to let go of my work to actually finish um, my school. 
kept accepting all these shifts and it was at a point where I didn't have any more time for my school. So I went on the leave of absence from my work. They were very understanding and now I'm back working full time. <laughs> One of the major changes within the past year has been the vaccine rollout. Have you or any of your coworkers been able to receive the vaccine? People my age have not received it. I don't know anybody my age in this country who's gotten it. I mean, I'm in a hot spot and so is my place of work and I'm an essential worker. So I don't know where that puts me on the list, but hopefully soon. All of my coworkers, including myself, have gotten their vaccine. Um, it was not optional. If you weren't getting the vaccine, you weren't going to be able to keep working at the residence. Um, I'm really thankful I got it. I encourage everybody to go get it because um, that's how we're going to get past this pandemic because we all work together. It was super interesting to see how life has changed over the past year for these teen essential workers. For more stories like these, head over to cbckidsnews.ca. For, for CBC, CBC Kids... What are you doing? This is my video. Okay. Okay. For CBC Kids News, I'm, I'm Anisha Lashman. Really? Really? Coming up, Rethinking Wolves, Johanna Wagstaff explains how the notion of alpha males and females may be a misunderstanding. Consider the wolf pack, led by the alpha male, and the whole hierarchy that follows includes a beta wolf as deputy and the omega wolf at the bottom of the rank. Newcomers and challengers and fights to the death, all part of the sophisticated group system. But it turns out, in reality, wolf packs are usually much less complicated. That's according to Norwegian scientists who say in a new study that our misconceptions are based on old studies that looked at wolf packs in captivity not in the wild. Most wolf packs simply consist of two parents and their pups. So the adults are simply in charge because they're the parents of the rest of the pack members. So how did the idea for the alpha wolf come about? It all started with Rudolf Schenkel, who wrote about social structure and body language among wolves in 1947. And he studied them at a zoo in Switzerland. It was his work that gave rise to the idea of the alpha wolf. Now, Schenkel also mentioned in his studies that it was possible that wild wolf packs consisted of a monogamous pair and their pups, but this information was overlooked for years. In the 2000s, David Mech studied wild wolf packs on Ellesmere Island in Canada for 13 summers. He wrote that what was commonly called the alpha pair was simply the parents of the rest of the pack. This new research from Scandinavia uses GPS to follow wolf packs, and it adds to this notion. They found wolf pairs are monogamous and unbelievably faithful. Most puppies leave the pack when they're one year old. At this point, the young wolves go out in search of a partner and a suitable area to establish their own territory. But some young animals remain in their parents' territory for one to two more years. There is indication that in some areas of the US, like Yellowstone, large packs of wolves actually hunt in teams. Here, there is a much higher prey density and completely different conditions. Wolves were actually reintroduced in the mid 19 90s. There, it's much more common for the pups to wait longer to go out on their own. The big takeaway from all this research is that the term alpha wolf is not widely used with wolf researchers. And now you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Thank you, Johanna. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Anita Bath. We are a year and a couple of months into all these video calls, Microsoft team meetings, Google Hangouts, Zoom calls. So you're forgiven if you don't quite remember what dressing well for a work meeting feels like. Sogo Clark is the owner of Wish Dry Bar in West Vancouver. She's here to offer a couple suggestions on do-it-yourself hairstyles for all those video conference calls. Before you opened this business, you worked in finance, Sogo. How did you prepare to put your best self forward for meetings in those days? Um, I would always get on stage. I would do a lot of PowerPoint presentations. And for that reason, it's interesting. That's why blowout was so important in my life because it really complemented the look of wearing a suit and just feeling really powerful as a female having fabulous hair. So why did you open Wish Driver? Then you wanted to share some of that with other women? 
it's interesting because I would like go to a dry bar every week and get my hair done and the blowout. I really wanted it to last like seven, eight days. And I know the power of having fabulous hair. Um, and to be honest, it was one of those uh, ideas that I had in the back of my mind for a long time and working in the corporate background, I knew I could bring something special to the market that wasn't around attention to details, customer service, different lines of pro product to be used, uh, educated, experienced staff. So all in all, I really wanted to bring something different to the market that really is an experience more than just a blowout. Well, you do have fabulous hair. Okay, so <laughs> who do you have there uh, today and what are you showing us? Okay, I'm joined by Melissa and Afrin. They're both uh, two of my top hairstylists. Today, Afrin will be our model. Uh, Melissa will be showing you two hairstyles. So as you know, with current Zoom meetings, what matters is top up. I think I've done a bunch of Zoom meetings with Lululemon pants and a blazer on and fabulous hair. I think we've all been there. So we're gonna do uh, one style of loose curls. Um, so we've already prepped the hair. What we're gonna start with is uh, dry shampoo. So we love the R and Co dry shampoo. This is one that we use the most um, because it takes away the excess oil from the hair. And it doesn't leave a residue. And uh, my background is not in hair. So I need the easiest products and the fastest way to look fabulous. So this takes out the excess oil. We've already prepped the hair. You can use a curler or, or an iron to actually give your uh, curls for your hair. I can't use a curler for the end of for the, at all. I'm not good at using a curler. So I rather use a hair iron. You choose the tool that you like to use to actually add some curls to your hair. So what's next Perfect. here? And, uh, um, and then we're gonna be using a dry texturizing spray. So at Wish Dry Bar, we carry three brands, r Co, Davinus, and Kevin Murphy. And that's because every hair type needs a different hair product. So we wanted to bring different types of hair products for different hair types. So this is the Davinus texturizing spray. As I mentioned before, with not having any experience doing hair, if I was gonna travel to an island somewhere, I would take the dry texturizing spray and a dry shampoo. Those are my must-tos. <laughs> So this actually gives the hair a lot of hold and grip and it keeps, um, keeps, uh, helps it keep volume as well. So we're doing the curls um, and then are we ready for the second style? So not, not now that we have the curls and as you know, you've done, if, as many of you have done Zoom meetings, the front of the hair matters, the back doesn't, which is <laughs> lovely. So we really want the front to look great. Um, and then our second style would be a side ponytail. So if we're doing a Zoom meeting, it'd be lovely to have like a side ponytail. You can use a cute scrunchie to make it look more feminine. Here we have the powder puff from Kevin Murphy. And this is fantastic for fine hair. You can put it on the root and it actually gives a nice volume after you tease the hair. So it's just very quick. Anybody can do it at home. It's just a little powder like material. And you just basically put it on, on top of your scalp on the root of the hair. And then you start teasing it with a comb just to give it a little bit of volume before you do the side ponytail. So good for someone who has a little bit of thin hair, I guess? Yes, it's very popular with our clients with thinner hair who want a little bit of more volume. And you want the volume to stay on. You don't want the hair to go flat. This is a lovely, lovely one to use. And then yeah. we're brushing the hair to the side. Yes. While she's doing that, talk to me about how uh, business has been hit during the pandemic. Has it been steady or have you really taken a, taken a hard one here? You know, well, it's been very challenging just from a volume standpoint and just making sure we've, we're sanitizing everything, just that constant worry that you have that what if someone gets COVID or what if a client uh, gets COVID. But in general, the community of North Shore has been so loving and so open and they've been so supportive. How important is it to keep these little luxuries in our lives as much as we can during this hard time? To be honest, I feel it's so important. I myself, like if I'm tired or if I'm exhausted or if I'm anxious, at least when I actually look in the mirror and I have nice hair and I come out for a scalp massage or a hair treatment, we have mother and daughters that come in to get hair done. We have young moms that have infants at home and they just wanna have a little break. Uh, we have realtors that come in with their laptop and start working here while their hair is getting done. So everybody really enjoys that time being here where they feel taken care of and they can have some self-care. Everyone loves a good pampering for sure. Sogal Clark, thank you so much. Sogal is the owner of Wish Dry Bar in West Vancouver. Thank you. Hi, I'm Johnny. This is Pink Lime Salon and Spa. Welcome to our Vancouver.
It is Mother's Day weekend. If you're looking for safe ways to celebrate mom, you can go for a stroll in Surrey's Glades Woodland Garden. The site is open Saturdays for pre-registered visits. The five acres offer many beautiful vistas full of rhododendrons and azaleas. Go to the City of Surrey website for more information. And West Vancouver's Artisan Ambleside Farmer's Market is open Sunday with safe spacing protocols in place. There will be fresh produce and a variety of prepared food for sale, including baking, syrups, honeys, and salsa. There will also be craft tables. Hey, Grant Lawrence from CBC Music here with a great story of attempting to overcome a physical calamity in an effort to create beautiful music. If you're a fan of eclectic modern folk, you might be familiar with a wonderful singer-songwriter from Toronto named Annabelle Chavostik. Besides her own solo career and writing with legends like Bruce Coburn, she was also a member of the beloved bluegrass folk band, The Waylon Jennings. June flowers are so bold on the devil's paintbrush road. The devil paints a double life from there. That's the Waylon Jennings with one of their most loved and successful songs, Devil's Paintbrush Road, written by Annabelle Chavostik from their 2006 album Firecracker, also named after one of Annabelle's songs. Now, Annabelle Chavostik has been involved in music in one way or another since she was a little kid. She first sang with the Canadian Opera Company when she was seven years old and performed on CBC television specials with icons like Anne Murray and Tommy Hunter. She only lasted a year or so in the Waylon Jennings before moving on to solo records and singles like this. From her amazing solo album, Resilience, from 2008, that is Annabelle Chavostik with the title track. And she didn't know it then, but Annabelle would soon be digging deep for her own resilience to overcome an unexpected workplace accident that has impacted her ever since. In 2015, during a sound check for a show of hers in England, Annabelle Chavostik was rocked by a very loud and sudden blast of feedback. As a result, Annabelle suffered severe hearing loss and tinnitus in her left ear. She was forced to dramatically slow her career down, but in the past few years, Chavostik has explored new ways of making music while coming to terms with her late deafness. This year, Annabelle Chavostik has returned to the solo spotlight with a spectacular new album. It's called String of Pearls, and it was recorded in mono to help other people with hearing loss continue to enjoy music. The first single is a gorgeous song called Walls, which hauntingly captures her hometown of Toronto at the beginning of the lockdown in 2020. That is the absolutely soaring new single from Annabelle Chavostik. It is called Walls. It's from her new album, String of Pearls. And that is the song 
that you need to add to your perseverance playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. I'll check in with you again next week. Coming up, a questionable future for a beloved bike park created for kids last summer. Welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Anita Bath. Well, dozens of East Vancouver kids have built a makeshift trail riding course inside a local park. It started last summer after city officials gave them the green light. But as John Hernandez reports, this year it looks like the park board has changed gears. It's not your typical biker gang, but the kids who live near East Van's Grays Park pedal together. This park's great. I absolutely love coming here on a sunny day. Like, this park is my life. Dozens take to this makeshift course every day, a refuge for riders like 12-year-old Liam Parker Vitell. My friends are here, and we can have all sorts of fun. There's a corner store just up the hill. We go get, like, snacks, and we come here and do all sorts of jumps. The kids started to build it up last summer. At first, there was pushback from city inspectors who deemed it unsafe. But after an outcry from parents and kids, the park board let them keep it. That's why parents like Michelle Woods were surprised to see that workers recently decided to flatten it. This year they've started it again, but for some reason, the operations department has been given a different message and they keep flattening it. So the kids just built it up again, starting a game of cat and mouse that's lasted all week and even prompted a visit from the VPD. They handled it very well, were very kind to the kids, um, especially when they found out that they had nowhere else to go. Today, more jumps and more kids who say this spot has brought the community together. They're taking it down because they don't want people falling and suing them. But like, on the other hand, so many people were coming because of it. Because of the virus, you know, you can't get out and go to like a mountain to ride, so it's convenient to have it right here. And a year ago, like, I didn't even know how to properly do the jumps, but now that I've like learned how to, it's like a new passion for me. And they don't plan on backing down. Like, we really love doing the jumps, and even if you do fill them in, we're, we're gonna build them back and you hissed. CBC News has reached out to the park board for comment. As for the parents, they're just happy to let the kids be kids. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Hi, my name is Mark, this is Cole Harbor, and this is our Vancouver. During the pandemic, we've been subjected to what some call an infodemic. It's a torrent of information, most of it false. But how can you tell if something is real or not when you see it on social media? Our Alex Megdal breaks down the five ways you can spot and stop the spread of COVID misinformation. Misinformation isn't new, but just like the virus, it can spread fast during a pandemic. The World Health Organization even has a term for it, infodemic. Here are some simple steps you can take to avoid falling for misinformation and spreading it. Step one, consider the source and check the facts. Always question where things come from. If it's unfamiliar, a quick Google search or a conversation with someone can do a lot more to understand like who's behind it. Try to figure out who created the content. Is the source named or anonymous? What are their credentials? Next, figure out what kind of content you're reading. Is it news, an opinion piece, or satire? Or is it purely word of mouth? Have other credible outlets reported the same information? Remember, social media is often not an official source. If you spend five minutes on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, you will find a lot of bad information. It's only five minutes. It will not take you a lot of time. Verify the timing. Consider this rumor on Twitter about a code orange signaling a mass casualty event at a major hospital. A new story matches the claim, but take a closer look at the publication date. If it's a website, check the domain name. Unusual domains like this one can be a warning sign. Step 2. Check for quality. Does the headline seem like clickbait? Are there any spelling mistakes like these? Does an image appear doctored? If so, you may be dealing with misinformation. 
Whenever possible, turn to official sources like the World Health Organization, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and your local health authority. Step three, check your biases and emotions. I think this is a big part of misinformation is to ask yourself, how does this make me feel? Am I scared? Am I worried? We know that emotion connects really strongly to your likelihood to share misinformation. Does the post urge you to share? Is it promoting an opinion? Consider what the source has to gain and whether your own beliefs and feelings could be clouding your judgment. Step four, if in doubt, don't share. More than half of Canadians have shared COVID-19 info online without knowing if it's accurate. And what if you spot info you know is untrue? I report it even when it's a family member. <laughs> uh, as a first step, that's a very easy, low confrontation option. So Twitter and Facebook all have, you know, report functions in them. If you're comfortable, speak up. Let the person know why their information may not be credible and help break the misinformation cycle. Coming up, warm weather, DIY fashion, CBC Life's Cynical Crafter shows us how to make our own tank tops. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Anita Bath. We are beginning to feel warmer weather in many parts of BC. When the sun does come out, should you want to show the guns, CBC Life's cynical crafter has you partially covered. It feels so tropical. Hey guys, you've sent in so many letters asking me where I get my tank tops, and usually I just steal them from the change rooms at the gym, but today I'm going to show you how to make an extra special tank top so you can look just like me. And today I'm contractually obligated to do it with a DIYing internet sensation with Wendy. Wendy has more followers than me. Oh. Let's get started. <laughs> We're just going to need a t-shirt, and then from some there, scissors. scissors, you're going to need markers, markers fabric markers, markers, if you want to decorate it, and then beads is the other thing you can you use to beads. jazz up your tank top. Ja I usually do that part. Oh, sorry. Go into where the seam is. Yep. Cut off the sleeves. Yep. And the seam the curve is? The place but where the fabric is joined together. Of course. I think we all know what a seam is. I am going to cut out a skull shape. Mm. You draw two big ovals near the top. Yeah. And then you draw kind of like a rounded triangle at the bottom in between them. Mm. Almost like a skull. Yes, that is what we're going for. So why did you choose the yellow tank top today? Oh, I went to a family reunion. Oh. I was in the park and there was a reunion going on and I thought, let's just, you know, join in. They called me Sandy. Do you have any um, favorite bands? Oh, yeah. Like what? The fun guys. They all play guitar. It's an experience. Oh. So for teeth, you're just cutting out like a series of rectangles, but they're gonna get smaller and smaller as you get to the corners. <clears throat> That's the second tooth. Mm-hmm. I saw you did a DIY of a Beyonce dress. Yeah. yeah. When are you gonna do one of a more popular singer? Beyonce was as popular as it gets. Sounds like somebody hasn't heard of Kate Smith before. Can you give me one of them? What? The silver beads. I just need one. Please. Oh, thank you. Isn't there a saying like crafting is sharing? I have a saying. Oh yeah, what is it? Crafting. So it's got the skull, eyes, the nose, the smile. That is sweet. Yeah. Do you like it? Yes. Uh, uh. Oh, okay. Oh, there's scissors attached. Oh my gosh. Ah. And there you have it. And there you have it. Your very own DIY tank tops. So you can look as hip and as cool as I do. You lied. Sorry.
Hi, this is Benji from Vancouver Studio Glass. And this is our Vancouver. Yay! Red hot. 35 years ago this week, Vancouver welcomed the world for Expo 86. The fair's theme focused on transportation, with pavilions from other countries showcasing their most innovative inventions. Millions of people visited the city, and the day before it all kicked off, the national host at the time, Milton Nash, got a look inside. With just a few hours left now before Expo does open, there's a real sense of excitement and anticipation here in Vancouver but relatively few people really know what to expect at the fair. So I've been roaming about the site, seeing what you'll be able to see at a world exposition with a theme of World in Motion. Motion is everywhere you look. The monorails get you around Expo quickly, but if you prefer a more leisurely trip, you can float around on the sky ride. When you're looking down, you'll see the biggest party we've had in nearly 20 years. Not since Montreal and Expo 67 have we had such a national celebration. There's everything here from the world's biggest flagpole to the world's biggest hockey stick and the world's biggest hockey puck. There aren't very many people around today, but come opening day, a couple of hundred thousand people will be crowding in here. And this is right smack in the middle of everything. So you can imagine how many of them will be saying, meet you at the hockey stick. And not very far from here, there are some other really imaginative exhibitions. Here's one, they call it Highway 86, and you'll see every possible kind of way of getting around, from submarines to motorcycles to wheelchairs. It just goes on and on, up one hill and down another. Right next door is something called the International Traffic Jam. You'll see some of the pretty different ways people get from place to place around the world. But really, the national pavilions are the heart of any World's Fair. There are more than 50 countries here, all of them boasting about what they've done. And you can eat around the world, too, in fancy restaurants at fancy prices. But if you want something quick and very special and very Canadian, you can always stop off at the Northwest Territories Pavilion and get a Muskox burger. Thank you. Welcome. Mm. That's good. <laughs> if you get tired of walking, you can take a ride. There aren't many of them, but for $3, the scream machine gives new meaning to the word thrill. If you can still walk after that, then keep going. You never know what you'll see next. Here's the world's biggest watch at the Swiss Pavilion. And you never know who you're going to meet next. There's the mascot of the fair, Expo Ernie. Well, bless my little robotic heart. It's Nolan Nash and the crew from the National. How do you do? Glad to have you here. Oh, Ernie, I'm well. Thank you very much. Had a terrific time so far. Where do you think we should go next? Oh, well, I think you should uh, head over to the CP Roundhouse, a nicely restored historic building. You'll love it. It's right over here. In front of the Roundhouse is the old CPR 374, the engine that hauled the first transcontinental train across the Rockies and into Vancouver. When you've gone all around and you're back at the good old hockey stick, there's still more to see. Just follow the signs for a free trip to the Canadian Pavilion at the other expo site. And then all you do is take the SkyTrain, push the button, off you go. Then just four minutes later, you're at the Canadian Pavilion. CBC Vancouver is lucky to have the talented Ben Nelms as a staff photographer. His still images add so much context and emotion to the stories we cover. Here's a sample of what he saw through his viewfinder this week. That's all for our Vancouver this week. Join me weekdays for CBC Vancouver News at 6 o'clock. Bye for now.